So hi everyone and welcome to all of you for this webinar called uh, Back to School. Last time I did one was in July, so that was quite a long time ago and we have a lot to cover today. Um, so for the new followers, as usual, I would like to start uh, going through quickly through my resume. So I started in 2000 as a cash equity trader uh, for an asset manager called Pierre Charon Gestion. Uh, then I moved for a fund manager called DTM, uh, where the asset under management were roughly under uh, 50 or around 50 million euros. Then in 2004, I joined Griffin Capital Management, where I was running part of a long only product and a long short product. Um, and Griffin Capital Management was both Western European team and a Eastern European team, and I was part of a Western European team. Then from 2009, I did prop trading at Infinity Capital Markets here in London, uh, which is the UK subsidiary of a US company called First New York, where I was running for nine years an absolute return mandate with no assets and widgets uh, constraint. From 2014 to 2017, I was a senior mentor. Uh, at ITPM and I left in 2017 and in 2018 I started my own mentoring program and in October 2019 I launched the 4 by 4 video series so almost a year ago so that is for my background so what about today today as usual doing this webinar something that I like to do and uh, you should uh, probably all be doing is looking at all the asset classes. So we'll be looking at the stocks, credit, commodities, FX. We're going to do a quick market review, uh, looking at the recent performances and uh, the possible catalyst uh, short to midterm. Then we're going to be looking at the Fed new rules that uh, uh, were covered during the Jackson Hole. Um, and more importantly, what could happen uh, during the next uh, FOMC meeting, which is going to happen next week and the communication and implication across asset classes. Um, then we're going to be moving on planning the trade versus trading the plan, uh, which is more or less talking about risk management and um, looking at real trading versus what people are going to be telling you on FinTweet. Uh, that is something that happened to me recently. Then we're going to be covering uh, the expiry that's going to happen next week everything that is related to options, that is related to implied volatility, not everything, but a lot, implied volatility, realized volatility, and um, what happened with the uh, uh, weekly call options with Robin Hood as SoftBank, and how option market is really affecting the underlying, any underlying these days. So that's something, if you are trading any market, you need to have an understanding of what is happening in the option market. And if we have enough time, I'll be happy to answer some of your questions as long as those are most nice questions uh, during a Q&A session. So let's start with the asset classes, asset classes performances. So this one is a chart that uh, I found with an asset, uh, uh, from a friend of a friend. And I think this is a, a, a good chart. So on the left hand side, you get the year to date performances. And on the uh, uh, right hand side, left hand side year to date, right hand side uh, week to date. And we're going to go up to here with the indexes, then we're going to be looking at uh, currencies, then we're going to be looking at commodities. So as you can see, obviously, what, the, what is the best performance year to date is the NASDAQ composite. Uh, but you can see that on the week to date, um, so that was as of yesterday, the market has been struggling with those big winners uh, and there has been a, a sell off in the market. Um, otherwise, in terms of currency, um, the euro has been strengthening uh, recently, but you know, we are talking two, five percent, uh, um, let's say, range over the last few months. And in terms of commodities, Pretty similar uh, performance for the gold with the uh, NASDAQ composite and the WTI is really uh, uh, the lagging uh, commodity uh, year to date. Um, so again, on the week, you know, if you've been following the market that the NASDAQ has been suffering and as well the WTI 
here you can re you can't maybe not really see the dot but uh, WTI has been down eight to ten percent on the week so there has been a week off across asset classes um, so now as always I want to be looking at the different sectors and the S&P 500 is made of 11 sectors uh, and year to date what have been the uh, performances again uh, the consequence of the weak WTI has been energy being down 44% on the year. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, technology which are up, which is up uh, 27%. And consumer discretionary, which is up. There is a lot of Amazon here. So that is a bit, um, um, let's say, skewing uh, the, uh, the performance of the overall sectors. Financials have been uh, pretty weak. And again, as I've been saying during many webinars, the financials have been, yes, have been weak on uh, the low uh, yields, which are not helping the banks. That's something that we have experienced in Europe over the last five years and more. Uh, and the yield curve being quite flat is not helping financials, but that as well a signal that the economy is not that strong. I don't, I've never seen a strong economy with not strong financial. Uh, so you uh, you have different stories between the IT that are uh, telling you a, st a strong economy, which is in reality uh, um, some sectors that are doing well in the economy, but the underlying uh, with the financials is not doing that well. If we look at the week to date sector performances, as we have been just saying, you know, IT has been pretty weak. Um, and across all the sectors, they have been negative. So um, the, the, defen the defensive sectors have been doing a bit of their roles, which is uh, utilities, for instance, even consumer staples only 2.6%, whereas the S&P was down 5% as of yesterday. If you take into account uh, today's sell-off, which is 1.5 to 2%, you should be adding uh, uh, then uh, probably 7% uh, um, uh, um, deep from, from what we have a week ago. So that is for the sectors. Um, if we carry on and we look across other asset classes, if we look at bonds, for instance, um, so I like to be looking at bonds in terms of, of BIPs um, and looking at the US, UK, Germany, Italy, Japan, uh, you can do obviously more. Uh, looking at year to date, we can see that uh, the world has been uh, trending lower. So that's the race for uh, yields to go much, much lower. Week to date, uh, there has not been that many changes. Um, but if you look at the US, and if you think in terms of carry trade, for instance, uh, with the US being down 122 bips, whereas Germany, for instance, is only down 27 bips means that uh, the carry trade between the euro dollar for instance is down 100 pips uh, which is one percent so yes i know that what people are going to tell me some people are going to tell me is the carry trade is still positive for the dollar but you need as well to be thinking in terms of trend so the trend has not been very helpful uh, if then we look at the vix which is the implied volatility for the s p 500 for the next months um, the implied volatility has been pretty high recently. Uh, today is at 29.67, so not very different from the 28.81 that we have here. Um, that has been a, a, obviously a quite big jump since the start of the year. I like as well to be looking at the top winners or top losers um, because that gives you some idea about, you know, some ideas of where to find some trades. Uh, so take your universe, do a screening and see who have been the winners and the losers. Um, so obviously we have done here through uh, asset classes performances, uh, but you can be drilling into more into the sectors, finding the names. So that's something that we do quite massively. And this is what I call the drilling in the four by four video series. You take the sectors, you find the names that are moving and you compare the performances of those stocks versus the sectors and the market. So you do an arbitrage. Um, if you look even more further down into the drilling, you can be doing the same on an industry level. Um, and then obviously you look at the single names. Quickly, I would like to uh, go through the charts. Um, you can still hear me, you can still see properly everything. Yes. So um, 
if you have questions, maybe uh, all along uh, um, this uh, webinar, you can be asking questions. That way we can be doing something that is more interactive. So uh, don't be shy. So here we are looking at the S&P. So the S&P uh, has been trading nicely since July and, and, and squeezing. Um, that is something that I'm going to be covering later with the trading plan. I've been pretty wrong um, and that is part of the trading and portfolio management. So don't be upset. Don't take anything as personal. This is what it is. Um, but the S&P, this is the chart. If we look at the, uh, at the NASDAQ, we had a massive move. Um, which was driven by a few names, uh, which have been the leaders. Now we had a sell-off, um, and the sell-off is, is more than 10%. As always, the question is where and if there is a follow-up. Um, if we look at um, something that I like to be looking is the S&P versus the Russell 2000, which gives you a good understanding about, you know, uh, what are the uh, what is the performance of the big companies and the companies that have exposure to the U.S. and there has been quite an underperformance um, recently on the S&P uh, and when I say recently this is from the highs that we had in March and and we have consolidations uh, since then uh, for the VIX again this is the same story we are trending lower we are making so far. Uh, uh, lower highs. Um, then if we look at the 10 versus the 2, uh, so it's at 50 bips, but more interestingly, um, the way is my US 10 years, the US 10 years is trending into um, some kind of a consolidation phase between uh, the 50 bips and the 80 bips. Uh, why? Because I, and not only I, but um, the Fed really wants to keep uh, uh, the 10 years under uh, a certain level. I think on one hand, you can argue that they want the 10 years to go lower in terms of yields. And on the other hand, because of the supply that is coming every week from the treasuries, uh, there is a, um, a need for higher yields. Um, so that is for, uh, for quickly, quickly, this is not perfect, but I want us to be quickly looking at all the, uh, the different um, Asset classes, uh, emerging market have been doing very, very well. Um, so this one is one of the trades that have been pretty wrong. Um, strong emerging market. Um, if we think uh, uh, something that I think we should really be looking at is, um, so let's look at CL2, which is less distorted, which is the, the, the crude oil. So the crude oil has been trading around 40 uh, since the start of July. And we discussed that from, from March onwards. Uh, it's obviously uh, crude oil is mainly a question about uh, supply and demand. Um, and you should keep in mind that normally at the start of the year, we had roughly 100 million supply and 100 million uh, uh, demand. Now the demand is roughly around 92 million, meaning that it's down 8% year on year. So if you think about a V-shape recovery in terms of the overall world, this is just not true. You are, tr you are trading 8% below in terms of oil consumption that you were a year ago. Uh, and as we had a huge imbalance between the, mar the, the months of March and June, you still get a lot of reserves coming. Um, so for many countries, you know, the low 40s were helpful. There have been talks that Iraq, for instance, is gonna be putting more supply into the market and more importantly, China, if you look at the import exports uh, uh, levels that we had recently, is as well uh, importing between one and two million less barrels uh, uh, every month. So we have this sell off now. I mean, sell off, it's not huge sell off, but we are back to the level of, of 36, 37. Uh, but that means it's going to have implication for uh, the oil, uh, oil industry. If you look at gold, that has been consolidating. I think you don't need to be a genius to see that um, there is this level that is, that is holding so far, which is the 19, 1905. Um, and then I think there has been a lot of, of positioning um, uh, and extreme positioning, which, which you know, means that a lot of retail jumped in, has been sh uh, shaken, and now it's a question of, you know, um, uh, um, how the positioning will be 
in that sense, the, the commitment of traders is, is always helpful to be looking at. Um, finally, quickly, because I don't want to be spending too much time on, on, on all the assets, uh, looking at the euro dollar, looking at the DXY. Uh, so today we get the ECB uh, with um, my dear friend, uh, French friend, um, uh, Lagarde. Um, she was not that convincing, but um, there have been talks that actually the ECB could be a bit stressed. But the, by the level of the euro dollar with the euro strengthening and, and in that sense, uh, dampening a bit inflation and not helping um, um, uh, Europe uh, exporters, I think she did an okay job saying, uh, you know, this is not the end of the world. Still, we are looking at it. Uh, the market came back a bit uh, today at uh, 118. Uh, it's always a bit testing the 117.50, 117.60. Um, many countries will lack their, their, their currencies to be weakening. That has been one of the uh, tasks, uh, one of the goals of, of the Trump administration as well. Uh, but obviously the dollar has been uh, weakening recently. Um, Let's uh, look quickly at some questions because uh, uh, I'm not going to be doing some technical charting today because this is not my job. Um, Joe, if you have, I mean, it's, it's not that I don't want to, but um, if, if you go through, the, through my different webinars, you'll see that all the technicals that I'm doing are pretty simple. So I draw lines, I look at the volume, I don't go for fancy uh, uh, um, technical analysis because I don't think it's, it doesn't work. Um, I think it doesn't work, sorry. Uh, so you have to keep it uh, uh, easy. Um, let's, uh, so there is a question of, on the US elections. Um, that's a good thing because we're going to be uh, covering the US elections. So let's go back to, uh, if I manage to do it, uh, let's go back to those slides. Um, the, the first thing that uh, always you're going to be looking at are the catalysts. Okay, so if you think about uh, when you're running a portfolio as a portfolio manager, as a trader, um, there is something that you always do during the weekend, Saturday, Sunday evening, it doesn't matter. You look at the catalyst for the week. Okay, so I just wanted to share quickly here. Those are the catalysts for next week um, based on uh, Reuters, uh, Reuters icon. So you're going to have, and you can have, you can find many, many uh, uh, macro websites where you're going to have all the information. Um, you decide which one to use. And obviously for next week, what is important is the of F FOMC meeting, sorry, the Bank of Japan meeting and the Bank of England. So uh, Wednesday and Thursday. So that is taking some of the headlines. You're gonna have some of the numbers from industrial production, which is a lagging indicator, housing starts, uh, 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 the U University of Michigan uh, sentiment indicators. Uh, those are the things that you should be looking and why you should be doing that because you know uh, uh, at which, uh, on, on which day those, those, those news are gonna be uh, coming. So that gives you the catalyst. So. Again, after the ECB meeting that we had today, uh, you should always looking at what's going to happen uh, next, the macro data uh, and those uh, bank central meetings. I think what is important for you as well is to keep in mind that uh, there are other catalysts and the catalyst as, let's say more as a trader, if you think about next week, next Friday, we have uh, the triple reaching or the quadruple reaching, which is the expiry. So. I've been talking a lot about quadruple reaching. When I do the mentoring, this is something that is important, more importantly because of the options that are driven the market. But next Friday, we have uh, the expiry uh, coming and that's gonna be a big driver. Um, and as well, if you are like me trading equities, you need to know when and uh, uh, will be the biggest events for next week. So if you think about uh, next Tuesday, we get Apple coming with uh, probably which, with its uh, new iPhone. Uh, so after the sell-off that we saw on, 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 on Apple, that could be a catalyst for Tuesday. Then as well, I think Tesla is having one of these meetings on these, um, uh, sorry, battery. Um, it's not that I'm a big fan of Tesla, but you know, the market is going to be concentrating a lot on these things. Then 
if you go a, a bit further, if you're uh, um, um, on the same day, we get the index rebalancing. So very often on this quadruple reaching on the same day, we have what we call the index rebalancing. So if you have been trading, if you have been in a trading room, it's called special situation and you identify um, which uh, uh, stocks are coming in, in, the, uh, in the index and going out of the, in the index. So here, this is for the S&P 500 where we get three new names entering and three names uh, exiting the S&P. So what you will be doing is you will be, there are three phases. They are trading before the announcements. So you try to find the names that could be entering and the names that could be exiting the indexes based on the rules of these indexes. Then you have uh, from the announcement to the day, it's going to be uh, effective. So which is going to be at the close of Friday in 10 days. And on the day, very often what you see because of the size of those imbalances, if you think about what is happening, is you have many ETF, many funds that are invested in the S&P 500 that are going to be forced, for instance, to be buying Etsy that have to be selling some cutie and most of the time what they will be doing is they will be doing this on the last five minutes so the last five minutes you're going to see some big moves in europe this is even more true so here i took the example of the euro stocks 50 where you have this year four names in and four names out meaning that on the close on friday from 5 30 to 5 35 and probably 5 40 which is for continental time and probably 4.30 for London time, there's going to be a lot of imbalances. And those are the trades that are very interesting to do. Um, I got a feeling, I got a feeling that uh, Telefonica is probably going to be, and BBVA are going to be some of the names to be looking at. Same for Adin. Why? Because there is a dual listing. So if you have access to both European market and US market, you could be literally be doing the trade where Telefonica could be selling off on the close and you'll be hedging yourself by doing uh, the opposite on the ADR. Again, uh, those are uh, by no means <laughs> what's going to happen and I'm not telling you uh, this is what I'm going to do but you should be checking if you are in front of your screen and if you want to, I think those are interesting strategies um, where actually for the ADR arbitrage on the close, those are uh, free money. Um, then in terms of catalyst, uh, mid to long term, not only because I live in the UK and I'm a dual citizen, uh, you have Brexit coming. Uh, it feels like um, there's gonna be another Sorry for my English shit show coming. Uh, the, the, the noise and is, is, is picking up. So here, this is from ING. I think that gives us a bit of, of, of the time frame for Brexit, even though you can argue that there is no time frame and, and, and no one knows what's going to happen. But if you look at the weakness um, over the last uh, couple of weeks, last couple of days, sorry, of the sterling versus the dollar, that tells you that this is... Uh, uh, this is speeding up. Um, so that's one of the catalysts and we should uh, still uh, be looking. Uh, another catalyst, obviously midterm, are the US elections. Uh, that will be starting with the uh, presidential election. Here it's coming from one of the websites where Biden is, is leading. I'm not taking any view. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm for Biden or for Trump. This is um, obviously, we know what happened in 2016. So we need to be careful with the polls. Um, and we know that there is a margin of error. It feels like uh, some of them, most of them are, are giving us Biden winners. I think what is interesting as well, as we discussed before, is to look as well uh, on the Senate and um, the House, the House. Um, and the Democrats seems to be, seem to be leading on both. Uh, meaning that if you think about what happened over the last 10 years, is the market really, really liked having um, Senate and House divided between Republicans and Democrats because that, that gave a good balance instead of having full Democrats and full Republicans. So 
the market is always these days uh, um, playing thing at the last minute. So that's something we should be considering. Be careful, uh, check those things. It's easier obviously when you are living in the US because this is something that you, you're experiencing every single day. For us in Europe that are massively impacted by uh, the US market and for you in Asia, uh, this is uh, something to, uh, to check. So um, in terms of, of, of Biden's uh, uh, winning, it will mean higher taxes, less liquidity. Uh, so that's a question from BC. I think I discussed that uh, a month ago. So actually that was for only four by four members, uh, subscribers. Um, yes, there will be implication if Biden wins and, and they pump up the taxes again. Um, if you want to do something that I've done is you look at income uh, before taxes and income after taxes and you will see obviously a broad uh, uh, difference uh, which is between 5 to 10 percent but some companies benefited more than others so what I suggest for you to do is having the 10 20 names that could really suffer if Biden, if Biden is elected um, because um, some sectors like the telco, for instance, benefited massively. Um, is it gonna be a market crash? Look, I think um, the Trump administration is pushing for the ID. <laughs> um, I don't think that is that binary, okay? Um, I think it's more like um, um, who's gonna be impacted. Uh, it's not black or, black or white. Um, so um, again, the market is all is really more and more into reacting at the last minute. But um, um, be ready in case of of, of uh, something could, will happen. So next one, um, the Jackson Hole. Uh, so every year, the Kansas City um, uh, Federal Reserve is doing this meeting. Obviously, this, this this year it was online. So it was on Thursday, the twenty seventh. Uh, where uh, Mr. Powell uh, discussed the new rules. So what are the new rules? Mainly it's about two things, which is about inflation and about um, unemployment. Uh, so here you get all the talks and it's about, you know, it's assessment of the shortfalls of employment from its, from its maximum level. Uh, and secondly, on the price stability, and I'm gonna read it, sorry for that, the FOMC adjusted its strategy for achieving its longer run inflation goal of 2% by noting that it seeks to achieve inflation that averages 2% over time. Following periods when inflation has been running persistently below 2%, appropriate monetary policy will likely aim to achieve inflation moderately above 2% for some time. So here we get the dual mandate on employment and inflation. So this is about stable prices and maximum employment. So uh, this is a review that the Fed started in 2019. So we knew that the Fed will come with something. Um, I think we, we will have to have much more clarification, hopefully uh, next Wednesday when uh, the Fed, um, not on the announcement, but after on the Q&A uh, question. I think it's pretty vague to say, you know, uh, for years we have not really managed to, target, to have 2% inflation and now we're gonna have higher inflation. So more or less what the Fed is, is telling us is the mandate is much more flexible, um, that they could run inflation higher if, if, if they think that this is appro appropriate. They don't want inflation to run like crazy but they are okay to run inflation for more than 2% for, for, for longer than, than, than before. In terms of unemployment, this is a bit um, vague as well. This is, you know, saying, you know, we want max uh, uh, um, employment in the meantime, they don't give us real number. So um, it feels more and more like uh, the central banks, you know, are giving themselves, um, let's say, um, an absolute mandate where they can do whatever they want. Um, so the size of the book is going to increase, more or less, meaning that QE, anything they want to do, they will do it. And they don't want to get stuck. And, and look, as we are facing uh, COVID and, and its implications, uh, I'm not blaming them. I think they need to have more 
um, uh, flexibility in their mandate. Um, still, if they don't uh, give a bit more clarification, I think the market at one stage could uh, could test them one way or another and saying, okay, where is where is the level where you do something? Um, but if you think and if we look at um, what the Fed is normally looking for inflation, it's not the CPI. So that's something I explained in the 4x4 four four, uh, video series. The Fed is looking at the core PC. So PC for the personal consumption expenditure, uh, so which exclude food and energy. And here you can see that since 2000, most of the time it has been below uh, 2%, the, the 2% target. So you can argue that the Fed has been uh, struggling to, uh, to reach this 2%, same as, as obviously the Bank of Japan and the ECB. So you can't blame them. Uh, and you can see as well that there is a strong correlation between the core PC and the Fed fund target. So that's in a sense quite normal to have uh, the Fed fund target at 0% these days because there is not much, much inflation. Um, and the, um, uh, the outcome of this is looking at the Euro dollar futures. The Euro dollar futures uh, from September 20 to December 2022, but actually, if you look at the Fed fund future up to January 2024, uh, the, the euro dollar futures market is more or less pricing. Nothing happening between now and then. So we should have lower for longer or lower maybe forever, at least for four years. Uh, so if you take here the 19977 and 19975, so in more than two years, this is flat and again, uh, here you see the chart that is, uh, we are talking 10 bits roughly, uh, but that's the same if you go uh, uh, until um, 2024. 20, so clearly um, what the Fed said uh, before Jackson Hole, confirmed on Jackson, with Jackson Hole and probably going to be confirming next, next week is lower for longer. And, and, and the Fed is going to be very accommodative for the next few years. Um, so let's look at the reaction uh, of, of, the, of, of the different asset classes uh, from the Fed. So here that is from, from the 27. Uh, and here this is the euro dollar. As you can see, strengthening of the euro, uh, then it's, it came back. So more or less no reaction. A lot of uh, was priced in by the market. Um, so uh, uh, obviously there are a lot of talk, uh, talks that uh, the target is for the Fed to be weakening the dollar, um, but you can argue that <laughs> any central banks is trying to do the same. So it's really a game of chicken and trying to, uh, uh, to reach the bottom as quickly as possible. Um, if you look here at the US 10 years, again, first reaction was uh, for yields to go higher. And then since then, it has been trading sideways. Uh, no, no real big moves. Um, then um, if we look at, um, so this is the equity market, S&P. So that is the run of the S&P market. Um, no change. Uh, it, it kept on going up. Then we had the sell-off. So that's a different story. And that's the same with the uh, WTI, trending a bit lower than acceleration on the downside. But that's uh, more or less uh, a change in the Fed uh, mandate, still targeting unemployment, still targeting the 2%, but the 2% is not as fixed as before. The 2%, I think, were in place since uh, 2012. Uh, again, they revised and were thinking for the last 12 to 18 months, they wanted to change the mandate or give them more flexibility. And this is what they have done. So no surprises here. Um, Next one is something that I want to discuss because I have many people that get frustrated this year uh, about the market going up, the market going down. And I want to discuss a bit the planning the trade versus trading the plan. Uh, uh, trading the plan. And here, I'm going to take a bit of the, of the blame, but I'm happy to do so because, you know, after many years, I, I'm fine with it. So at the end of July, of this year, I came with this blog looking at the seasonality of the market. And this is always something that I look at trying to understand, you know, how is the seasonality, if there is seasonality. And if you look um, 
over 50 years, uh, you can see that the NASDAQ composite very often in the month of August and in the month of September uh, is a bit weak. Okay, um, so that means overall over the, those two months, market is pretty weak. So my idea was saying the NASDAQ composite has been pretty strong in July and then pretty weak in August and in September as well. So again, uh, um, here the question is, I know that many traders are frustrated. Um, so more recently it was the fear of missing out. Uh, um, and if you are on social media, if you're feeling pe following people, there will always be the red pretenders, the people that will bully you. Uh, or the people that um, uh, to do so. My view is always the same. You have a plan and the plan you stick with your risk management and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But um, I've done that many, many times and over different time frames. And again, what is important is to have risk management, stop loss. It's not nice to be hitting the stop loss, but if you want to be successful, uh, that is the only way to do it. Plus, if you want to, people to believe that you make 50 to 100%, then obviously you will not be listening to this uh, um, uh, webinar. And this is why you are with me. So at the end of July, I came with this idea. I was short. And here, let me give you the planning the trade versus trading the plan. So if we look at the end of July, this is where is the, the, the NASDAQ 500, okay? So that was at uh, 1070, uh, 1070, sorry, 10,700. And, and on the month, we went up 10%, okay? So that is the reality between planning the trade and trading the plan. So I was not, uh, for me, uh, because let's discuss my own experience, I was not uh, short the S&P, but I was, uh, sorry, not short the NASDAQ, but short the S&P and short some, 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 uh, um, growth names and and on the day i don't know if you remember for those of you who were trading on the day that was salesforce which came with their numbers the whole market gapped up that was the day when i decided to close it um that is painful again but you know uh, this is part of, of 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 the trading plan so planning the trade versus trading the plan so you need to keep in mind that the plan could be static, okay? So that's your plan when you come with an ID and you're facing many, many different, different drivers. The market volatility, some incoming news, the time, your PL, some other factors, okay? So that's some factors that we're gonna be discussing later, why the market has been so strong. And here, what really you need to have, and, and I know I'm boring and, and some people hate me because it's not fancy, but risk management is still key. So uh, uh, you have the plan, but if it doesn't work according to the plan, you just uh, uh, cut your position. Um, are you flat since inception or up? Uh, that's a question. Uh, I'm just flat. So I cut everything. I read the market pretty badly. I'm flat on the, since I restarted in February. That is pretty shite, I have to say, but this is what it is. But again, what I want you to understand is only people on FinTweet, only people that you know never showed you your, your, their, their track record does not have stop loss, okay? So I know it's easy to follow those people that don't get fooled by people who always make money. There is a catch and there is probably a, a lie. As well for me, what is key is you want to live to trade another day. So if you're wrong, I know it's painful. I know we all want to be making money. If you close your position, you're still in the game. You have... I have too many people that come to me and lost in March, you know, 80, 90%. Then, you know, I'm pretty sure that in the next couple of months, I'm going to have uh, new mentees, new people coming to me and admit that because they didn't uh, uh, follow good risk management, they are down 50, 60, 70%. And that is just not possible. So what is key here is you need to avoid big drawdown as uh, the idea with managing money is, I mean, even if it sounds really good, is the power of compounding. But if you go down 20, 30% on one year, obviously to go, if you go down 50% on one year to recover your money, you need next year, the year after to be up 100%. So be careful on planning the trade versus trading the plan. We'll, if you put a trade by definition, you always get a conviction from somewhere. So you are always 
working on this idea. And that means the conviction, you don't want the conviction to just uh, uh, carry, carry you away too much. So I discussed that before, I discussed what was my positioning um, to give you a rough idea. Until May, I was up nine, ten percent. I gave up a bit, and I gave a bit more, with limited risk management. So, if you think about my exposure, as I advise in the four by four, that was a net exposure of thirty, forty percent. When the market is up against you, twenty-five, thirty percent, you end up being a uh, uh, flat on the yield. Again, that is not nice, but I can tell you that the ninety percent uh, retail traders this year are losing a lot of money. Um, so trading, trading plan, three things to keep in mind. Where's the idea coming from? So when you put a position, short term, long term, mid term, and which strategy you're following. So go back to your uh, ID generation process. The beauty of trading is the PNL doesn't lie. So if you're not making money, there is something wrong. If you're making money, why not? Okay, we, <laughs> you can be making money, but you are making assumptions on your analysis. So do not get fooled uh, uh, um, when you make uh, um, those mistakes again and again. Uh, the second part is the size and the allocation. So when you put money into one idea, which becomes a trade, how much money should I be putting at work? So I know from experience with the four by four, with the mentoring, this is a big part where people are really, really struggling. Okay. And actually, so recently I came across uh, one of my mentees is struggling with the sizing, is struggling with the sizing. And, and you need to think, okay, how much gross exposure, net exposure, how much I'm, I'm happy to put for each position. Um, so again, I give you a bit of, of color of what I've done this year in, in terms of, of trading. Um, I feel more and more that, um, and this is what I said to my, to my mentees, if, to be a good mentor, it's not that easy to do the mentoring and the trading at the same time. Why? Because, you know, um, dedicating a lot of time to mentoring is a different game than doing the trading. So, but for you, you have a choice to make. It's the risk management and the size and the allocation. So again, work on it um, because there is nothing more annoying than losing money because of the size. Um, then finally, for the trading plan, uh, the start target and the stop loss. So which means the risk reward of the trade. And again, for any mentees that I have, it's about, you know, when we do the mentoring program is looking at the upside versus downside. So each time you look at the trade, you say, okay, what's my upside? What's my downside? You do it over and over and over. So as I said to one of my mentees at the start of the week, me, I got um, a complete, um, so my whole life is about risk reward. So many people will, I'll talk to someone and say, oh, it's about the risk reward. And they look at me and say, look, you think as a trader, and maybe this is a huge, um, uh, dislocation for me. Uh, but I think that is important always to think, okay, what can I win? When can I lose? Um, so you don't want to be stuck between the binary outcome of target and stop loss, which is easy to, to, to say much harder to do. Uh, why? Because again, the market is very volatile and you'll be facing things that you're not always expecting. So if we look at the first part of the presentation, we are looking at the catalyst. So you get the catalyst in terms of market, the catalyst in terms of economy, of macro, in terms of, of special situation, then suddenly everything goes down the toilet because something is happening. Still, if you have a hard stop loss, you're going to be alive. If you start in, in, in January, you don't have any stop loss, you're long, you don't 80% and you don't recover from that. Okay. If you join the market 10 days ago, because you know, Apple is going up, Microsoft is going up, you've done 10% plus the concentration, you've probably done more than that. So those are the three things to keep in mind. There are many more, uh, but for me, it helped, you know, trading plan um, and, uh, and versus planning the trade. So now let's go back to something that is more market um, and, uh, and looking at how the market has been driven recently. Um, so that is something that is in the news. So that is not new to you. 
but I've been discussing that since January onwards. Uh, this is the volatility and the effect of weekly call options on the market. Um, so for those of you who have been trading uh, since 2016 and before, in 2016, in August 2016, the CDOE, which is in charge of options um, for the US market, have been introducing uh, weekly options uh, on the S&P. So instead of having um, options uh, on the quarterly, you have weekly options. And actually these weekly options, you have some weekly options maturing on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So plus some other rules. But more or less, the market is much more active and much more driven by options since 2016. So actually, if you've been trading the market, as a trader, you knew that something from 2016 changed. If you look at the 2017, for instance, implied volatility, realized volatility, which was very low, that was partly due to this change in those weekly uh, options. So here, yeah, this is about the gamma effect. Um, I don't wanna be discussing too much, but what I find interesting, so here, this is from Goldman Sachs, and I want to be looking at how the market these days is even trading differently day after day. Why? Because of this uh, uh, expiry. So if we look, and today is a good example, if you look at the returns for the last five months on the S&P on an intraday basis, on, uh, on a close to close uh, uh, basis, you can see that Thursday is a really bad day versus the other one, okay? Um, and I'm gonna try to explain why. Here you have the expiry on the Monday, the expiry on the Wednesday, and the expiry on the Friday. So as you can see, over these three expiry, on the day of these three expiries, the market is performing quite well. Otherwise, on the Thursday before the biggest expiry, the market is struggling. So if you look at last Thursday, if you look at this Thursday, when the market starts to sell off because of the gamma, because of all those weekly options, as it is running away from the winners, from uh, those weekly gold buyers, uh, we are selling off. So um, I've done the same because I like uh, Goldman Sachs, but um, with a pinch of salt, I checked all the numbers and, and I had exactly the same numbers as we can see Thursday is really a struggling day. So let me try to explain to you, hopefully you're gonna understand and I'm gonna be good at explaining the concept of realized versus implied volatility. So this chart is about um, uh, the implied volatility versus the realized volatility of the S&P 500. The implied volatility by definition is the VIX. So as you can see, most of the time, the realized volatility stayed high versus the implied volatility. Uh, why? Because most participants, when you're a participant, you'll be buying protection most of the time on the downside if the market sells off. And in reality, you're gonna be paying between three to 5% more than the realized volatility. So if you have the realized volatility at 10%, the implied volatility, the VIX will be at 15%. Here on the right-hand side, now we get the second chart, which is the implied volatility minus the realized volatility for the last year. So as you can see during the sell-off, during quite a period, the realized volatility was much higher than the implied volatility. But what we had recently is the, the implied, the IV was much higher than the realized volatility. To, the, to uh, more or less realized volatility was at 10% when the implied volatility was at uh, 27, 28%. So you had a differential of 17%, which is huge. But the market keeps on going up. So normally, again, 90% of the time, when the, the S&P is going up, the volatility is coming down. And vice versa, when the market, the S&P is going down, volatility is going up. But because we had many weekly buy calls, 
that completely distorted the volatility. So people were buying outliers with the volatility, with the calls, and that was distorting the VIX. So as the VIX was distorted, that was jumping higher. Okay, so we had this discrepancy between the two. So here I'm mixing a bit of everything, but you know, as we have to be quick, um, I would like as well to be looking at the VIX structure. That's something we discussed before. And that is important because we can see that there is a spike in the VIX, which is mainly due to elections. Okay, so there are many, many factors that were expecting the VIX. A spike, we're gonna discuss as well how and uh, it has been happening. So if we take the, uh, uh, the, uh, the S&P has been mainly driven, as you might know, with some names uh, uh, in the market. The names being AMD, Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, Tesla, obviously, uh, um, and some others. So very often, if you were coming into uh, the expiry, so here, that was the expiry for last week, September the 4th, the Friday, as you can see, there was massive open interest at 83 and 85. So you do have this natural magnet for the market to go into the 83, 85, as long as the market is not selling off. So here, this is the implication of what uh, 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 traders, retail traders in the US were, were doing in terms of leverage. If you are a trader in the US, retail trader, you don't have much leverage. So that means the only way to do leverage is to be playing with options. Okay, so that gives you huge leverage. So if we take this example of AMD, if you were to buy uh, uh, last week, uh, that was actually on, on the Thursday at the close, if you were to buy AMD call at 82, which was trading at 165. So here there is no bid and ask, but again, you should be trading the mid. I've done a video last week on uh, how to execute the options. Uh, just had an email from one of my ex mentees thanking me about this video. I think this is important for you to watch these videos if you are trading options. But more or less, if you pay $165, what is my delta exposure? My delta exposure is the last times 100, which is the multiplier times your delta that is here. So that gives you $4,700 uh, uh, versus $165. So your leverage is around 28 to 30 times. Okay. And here that is only for one day. But what you have is what happened in the months of July and August when the market goes up, when the stock goes up, each time you buy an option, the market maker has to hedge himself, okay? And through the Delta. So he has to do it by buying some stocks. If from one day to another, the stock is going up, so that means the Delta is going up. What needs the uh, market maker do is buying more Delta. So that is, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in other words, a loop effect of the, of the gamma. The other way around is obviously the gamma, the delta, anything that is option could go both ways. So if we look at last week, and I think this is important, sorry, I'm gonna drink a bit, but. Sorry, let's look at what happened last week. So last week, the, the sell-off started on Thursday. So if you do weekly options, that means most of the time on the Thursday, you are betting on options call options, long call options that are expiring the day after on the Friday, meaning that your theta, your time decay is close to zero. And that means that if the underlying starts to move away from your strike, the value of your option is coming down very quickly and you need to cut your position. So as you can see from the time of the open on the third, which is here, quickly when you start to sell off, there is acceleration. Okay, so that's the overall day. Then that's the overnight and same happened on the Friday on the open because people, or I should say traders that have short term position with options have no choice than selling their position quickly because they know that it's gonna otherwise 
the expiring worst list. So many of you probably uh, read the story about uh, SoftBank, uh, SoftBank, which is um, kind of a kamikaze uh, fund investing in WeWork that was a disaster. So that's, uh, um, that has been run for years and years. And recently they have been playing this, uh, these call options, not on a weekly, uh, basis, but on a longer term uh, basis. But what we can see is uh, the pink uh, chart here tells you that uh, the single stock calls have been much higher over the last uh, few months. That's something again that I've been discussing and discussing and discussing and discussing. So if you want to understand the market, look at weekly options, be familiar with Delta, with Gamma, Gamma effect. Um, where is the uh, option, uh, where are the interest, uh, what are the imbalances, what are the strikes, you can do that on different uh, time frames. Um, that's going to help you massively, that helps me massively. Um, if we look again, so that's for instance an option volume on a single day, so that was last week on the 4th of, of September, we can see that the volume are mainly driven, the biggest volume are the uh, technology one. Apple, Tesla, Microsoft, uh, Neo, all the names, and you can see. So what I've done is I look at the option volume versus the share traded. So if you more or less say options volume times 100, the multiplier, you can see that there are more options trading for many names that they are on shares traded. So the volume these days is on the options. So the market is driven by options. If you don't get it, then don't trade the market because um, it's not going to work for you. Uh, quickly, before the questions, I want to go through uh, what and how I can help you. Um, so I started again uh, doing the mentoring on my own in 2018. I launched last year the 4x4 video series. Um, and I do both the 4x4 and the mentoring program. And um, so I have more and more uh, mentees doing the 4 by 4 video series. Why? Because they are missing key concepts and they have been struggling with uh, some other misleading process. Um, uh, the 4x4 the, the is a very comprehensive offer um, and as well the mentoring program is one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions that I do on Skype. Uh, it is helpful. If you have question on it, I'm happy to have a, a free Skype call to answer your question. Um, and for successful traders with a good track record, um, I might help them uh, having some connection in the industry. Um, so what is the four by four? So that is a very comprehensive online video course uh, to get a professional investment process based on my 20 years experience as both a portfolio manager and educator. I launched that again in October, 2019. Uh, uh, there is both macro analysis and very important to me and to my mentees is building your own infrastructure for trades generation across asset classes with a focus on stocks. Uh, so we're going to have four ways and that's very similar to what we cover today. We're going to be doing top down, bottom up, special situation and active trading. There will be more than 40 videos, um, so which gives you roughly 30 hours of footage, more than 50 Excel spreadsheets that I try to update every month um, as much as possible. And you can find the testimonials that are on the website. Uh, plus as well, if you have questions, information, or if you want to send me an email. In terms of uh, combination, you can do both the 4x4 and the mentoring program. Uh, the mentoring program are two weekly one-on-one -on -one online sessions on Skype. Um, my conviction is it is extremely, extremely powerful. Uh, again, you're going to be first uh, uh, by uh, working on building your infrastructure and learn how to trade real money in real time. So what we do together is you come with your portfolio and I help you um, managing your own money. So I'm not giving you the ideas, I'm just giving you the process and I help you uh, uh, being better with your process. So the process that is used is exactly the same as the 4 by 4 where I want you as much as possible to generate a consistent flow of ideas, uh, one to three to five ideas every week, uh, keeping in mind that the ideas are not necessarily trades, 
and we're going to be looking at different asset classes, time frames, and strategies. And finally, for those of you, uh, not all of you, uh, you might want to have access to the industry. Uh, so that is clearly a way to help you with uh, uh, building your track record. Uh, in terms of pricing, the four by four video series offer two uh, different options. One is a two months episode because I think one month is too short. So that, that is realistic to go through all those videos in one month, which is $2,000. And the one year, which is 2,500. Uh, and I said, as I said, I can do the, uh, the mentoring program as well. And there's a combo offer, which is a discount again for the mentoring. This is one and one. Then we discuss if there is a match. Uh, so feel free to send me an email um, and I'll be happy to take uh, this call. Keeping in mind that um, for the end of the year, I know I've limited seats because uh, there is more and more demand for this product. Uh, so you need to give me a, a, a heads up um, before uh, going for the mentoring. Uh, 